If we could call the meeting to order or not. Tucker Whitman? Here. Andy Dennison? Present. Ben Vitale? Present. Grant Kyle? Here. Paul Pichty? Yes. Aileen McNabb Coleman? Present. Joe DeForest? Present. Terry Baxter? Aye. Joseph Bennett? Here. Frank Reginelli? Here. <coughs> Patrick Mahonick is excused. Timothy Lattimore? Here. Michael Didio? Here. Ryan Foley? Present. Keith Batman? Here. If we could. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The, well, I don't have a report tonight, of course, but I do have uh, an announcement. The uh, and that is that the end of and a question and the announcement is this I'm going to have a the what I'm terming a public li listening session from 4:30 to 5:30 before the June June 27th uh, legislative session for anyone that wants to come in and talk about shared services the uh, so it's just an opportunity for the public to come in if they they uh, have anything to say uh, any ideas to share or whatever so you all will see that advertised. You're absolutely welcome to come, and you're welcome to comment, if you wish. But it's not a legislative meeting, so the legislative meeting will start at 6 on the, as, as scheduled. Uh, the second thing relates to the legislative meeting, and that is that in the past, in the summer, we've had our legislative meetings uh, uh, half an hour earlier. However, we're already starting at 6, and so I wanted to find out if people wanted to start at 5.30, or leave the meetings at six throughout the summer. So, what do you? What do people want to do? Five thirty. Six. Six. Okay. <laughs> well, let's. We have right. Yes. Well, I think is. Well, how how many people will actually have trouble getting here if we do at five thirty? Not. You. Okay. So let's keep it at six because if it's going to be a if it's going to be a, a difficulty for people to get here that early, we don't want to create a problem for legislators. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Communications man. Yes, sir. A letter from Ray Lockwood regarding the Cuga County Farm Bureau's concern about the legislature submitting an amicus brief for the lawsuit being filed against the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. That's it. Yeah. So we're starting tonight with a discussion the, uh, about the job description for our county administrator. So if I could turn it over to Mr. Miller. So I'm going to review what we've been uh, going through since roughly the end of April with respect to a uh, project that uh, was brought in to uh, facilitate primarily, and that is to uh, come up with a definition, some defined roles, responsibilities, levels of authority, and boundaries for uh, different entities within the county. So with, the, uh, with respect to the chair, the legislature, legislative chair, the legislature and the oversight committees, county administrator uh, function and then the department. So uh, we're going to walk through a process that we use and then talk a little bit about getting into the job description and the specification. Yeah, Tim? Could you move the mic microphone yeah. on? Okay. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. So um, basically uh, to start out with, uh, the goals of the project as we started out um, is, was to define, document the key roles, responsibilities, level of authorities, and boundaries for the Leg Cougar County Legislative Chair, the Legislative Legislative Committees and Oversight Committee Chairs, uh, the County Administrator and Department Heads. And a secondary, one of the primary outcomes uh, that we were looking for with the project was essentially to define the job description or job specification for a County Administrator based on 
what came out of uh, item one up above. In terms of the process we used, uh, we really focused the process on uh, focused, it started with input from focus groups. So this was before I actually got involved and started the project, but there was a series of focus groups that were held uh, with department heads, with various entities within the county legislature to uh, have some discussion around the county administrative role and whether uh, and what that role should be, what were some of the key challenges with the role, um, issues, challenges, those types of things. So that was some initial input I received to kind of frame things and to begin to frame things for the project. Um, then the uh, next thing in terms of the process was essentially facilitating a series of meetings. So uh, this started roughly at the end of April. Uh, the first series of meetings with, was, was with the legislators themselves. And what we did during that time was to introduce um, a framework, what we call the Cuyahoga County Operating uh, framework, uh, operation, operational operating framework. <coughs> and what that was meant to do is to begin to put a framework around how do we define roles, responsibilities, accountability, and level of authority, as well as the boundaries for the, each of the four entities, entities that I talked about. And so we conducted uh, that initial meeting in April, and then we conducted a series of meetings uh, and facilitated a series of sessions between April and essentially last week. Uh, the last session we had uh, was uh, last uh, Tuesday, or Wednesday, I believe it was, or Tuesday, June, se June 7th, I believe it was. So uh, basically what we did with that meeting uh, was we focused that uh, uh, on those, on facilitating those meetings was to gather input. Uh, so a lot of the focus there was gather a lot of input uh, with respect to the four entities that I discussed. <coughs> we identified and uh, started to frame and draft roles, responsibilities around some key functions. So really, a lot of the key functions we worked on were centered around how these four entities interact or have to interact and work together uh, in terms of operating the county and the county government. Um, we uh, documented the revised Cuyahoga County uh, Administrator job description um, as uh, part of the process. And then uh, today is kind of the final step in that process. There was an eight-step process to review that with the full legislature. So that's the process that we went through. Um, so the next series of things to talk about are really focused on the job specification itself. And so uh, after gathering that input, all the uh, defining the roles, responsibilities, defining levels of authority, defining the boundaries for each of the four entities, that fed into creating uh, the job description that we're gonna, gonna be walking through uh, this evening. And so uh, key things in terms of distinguishing features, and I'm not intending to kind of read this whole thing out loud, but basically the focus of the county administrator is going to be to oversee, provide leadership, and have general supervision over departments within the county. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the main crux of this. Uh, county departments, offices, agencies, county government structure, through the county administrator, maybe <coughs> the time, the time they may delegate that responsibility um, going forward. And so, uh, you know, some of the key elements of the <coughs> typical work activities would be uh, as outlined here. So, first off, execute and enforce as authorized by the legislature. So, essentially, the focus here is uh, the legislature defines uh, those specific laws, acts, regulations, policies. But basically, the administrator is responsible to make sure that uh, the workings of the county are adhering to those laws, activities, uh, ordinances, resolutions, and or uh, regulations uh, as defined by the legislature. Um, and exercise general supervision over all county institutions, agencies, um, as well as be an advocate for county department heads within the legislature. So, one of the things that came out uh, after discussing and going through and reviewing this with uh, a number of people, um, really from all, all aspects of the go county government that we interviewed, uh, the focus was, you know, this person needs to be an adv advocate and he needs to be able to advocate for the county departments and county agencies, those types of things. So, made sure we put that into the job description as well or specification. Um, you know, setting annual goals, um, 
Uh, this, this item uh, is actually going to get modified slightly uh, in terms of completing annual evaluations for department heads. We said excluding elected department heads, but uh, there's also appointed department heads that uh, basically are appointed. Uh, so that, that would be uh, appointed either by statute, by law. Uh, those would be people that essentially the administrator would give input to, but not essentially have the full responsibility to give the evaluation or full evaluation. Uh, those, those entities are evaluated by uh, a committee. So basically that's one minor change we're going to be making with this. Um, in the balance of this, uh, another key couple of things that came out uh, were uh, with respect to budget, the county administrator's role with respect to the budget. And so uh, the focus of this is that the county administrator would be working with the budget office and work with department heads to put, put together a proposed budget for the county. And they would, in fact, present that proposed budget to the legislature. Uh, and ultimately, when the budget's approved, their responsibility is to ensure that the budget is being executed as voted on as, as agreed by the legislature. Uh, so the key with that was that a lot of the input was people want to make sure that the administrator has an ownership of the budget at a high level, but not down at the detail level. You know, they don't need to necessarily know every intricate in and out of each department, each department budget, uh, nor should they, nor may not they, they have time to. So a big focus of that was keeping the administrator's role at a high level, A, making sure budget gets put put in, submitted, approved, and it's executed as submitted and approved, uh, in fact, within the boundaries of that budget. So that's a key point that I wanted to make with the budget. Um, the last one here, too, develop, maintain professional relationship with all county elected officials to support the accomplishment of the county goals and objectives. Again, a key thing. A key element of this is in terms of the administrator and the working relationship is there'll have to be a strong working relationship, obviously, with the legislature, with the legislative chair, and with the department heads. And so really uh, the focus there is making sure that uh, as a new administrator may, gets brought into the organization uh, that there's a very strong relationship, <coughs> number one, but also a very uh, supportive respect and respective relationship, respectful relationship there. Um, a few other key things to point out in terms of the details. Um, essentially, it's, uh, you know, assist with coordination of uh, policy, make recommendations to the legislature around policy. Uh, again, the administrator doesn't have the authority to go make policy on their own, but those policies need to be recommended, brought before the legislature for review for approval. Um, some other key things uh, essentially is to review and approve resolutions by department heads or as committees may direct. Uh, so making sure those resolutions get brought forth and get reviewed and get voted on from the legislature by the legislature. Um, and then, you know, conduct regular meetings with department heads, others as deemed necessary. And uh, ultimately, uh, the key here is uh, they have the responsibility for approving the organization within a department or agency or an operation subject to his or her dis direct administrative control and they'll, they'll have the administrative control of, uh, of your temporary assignments within that department. Uh, that's not to say that uh, the operation from the department uh, itself, the, the, the focus with the department heads with this is to make sure that, you know, department heads have the full authority, responsibility to operate their department within their set budget. Uh, within the guidelines and the policies and regulation and law uh, that the county needs to adhere to or abide by. Um, and, uh, you know, then the general overall disclaimer here at the bottom, have the so other such powers as deemed uh, and conferred and imposed upon by him or her by resolution of the le legislature. Uh, some key things in terms of this next area is full performance knowledge, skills, abilities, personal characteristics. And so uh, a few key things to point out here. Uh, this first one really is a key element of this, and that is the ability to maintain effective working relationships with employees, department heads, officials at various levels in the government. And so, you know, the focus there is um, 
one of the keys with it with the incoming administrator was is going to be have the skills and the ability to work with a variety of different people a variety of different levels uh, and really create good solid <coughs> positive working relationships uh, certainly the others are key knowledge of principles of public administration administrative management organization and operation of budgetary procedures and practices, a good knowledge of human resource, labor relations principles and practices, and et cetera, down, as, as shown down through the list. And then qualifications, um, pretty straightforward. You possess a, either master of public administration, master of business administration degree, or a master's degree closely related to the field, and a minimum of four years paid full time. Uh, pos oops, excuse me. Possess a bachelor's degree from an accredited college, university, and a minimum of six years of satisfactory full time management responsibility and experience. Um, and uh, the county administrator is to hold no other public or political office except upon approval of the legislature. And uh, one other minor change that we made with this was that uh, essentially um, if they're not a resident of the county at the time of appointment, should become so within 90 days of appointment or a time period to be agreed to by the legislature. So depending on the person, the circumstances may uh, warrant extending that or changing that 90-day window. So that's the overview of the job description. So uh, at this point, any questions that you might have? Andy. Can you go back one screen there? I can. The very bottom one, I think you got to be a little careful with. Okay. And I'm just thinking, your HR guys here, I would think. <coughs> I mean, I don't know what, how did that get defined, I guess? What does that mean? Physical. Physical no. condition, I mean. Well, it's a, a, uh, a general kind of statement. Anytime that you go through the application process, you make uh, available to the person to identify any uh, accommodations you might need. And so that would be, uh, I guess, complement this. Uh, the, um, uh, there wouldn't be any specific physical restrictions that I'm aware of. If, for example, uh, the uh, uh, person had uh, visual impairment and whatnot, then we would ask for what kind of accommodation would they need? Would they need uh, a special readers or those kinds of things? I'm just thinking the way it reads, you know, we could have the best qualified person in the world might be in a wheelchair. Yeah. And when you read that, it makes it sound <coughs> like, you know, I hate to turn somebody away and turn them <coughs> off because they say, well, I was in a wheelchair, so they said I couldn't qualify for the job, that's all. Okay. <coughs> um, I'm going to look to our attorney. I, I'm i having a little bit of an issue with the word ability. <coughs> um, just because somebody has the ability to compile data for reports and make presentations does not mean they are going to do so. <coughs> um, <laughs> I hate to say, change it to the word must in every one of those instances, but I have a hard time with that wording. Is that a vendor done that? Yeah. I'm not sure how to respond. The use of the word ability appears in any number of other civil service job descriptions. It's to ferret out that, that set of skills, I think, as opposed to actually doing that. I would think that the actually doing would happen or be reviewed at the performance evaluation time. So now I understand what you're saying. Proving. You, you could include the term demonstrate, uh, which would be part of, uh, among other things, the, the reference process. Because uh, they, they would, in an interview, either phone interview or personal interview, you can say, you know, you have to demonstrate the ability to maintain effective working relationships. Demonstrate proven to something so that when we get to the review process, they can. I mean, we could say you're not doing this, and they say, "Well, I have the ability." Mm -hmm. 
and again, dem demonstrated uh, works uh, as good as anything that I've had in my experience. Uh, and again, that's part of the interview process. Okay, that's, that's really the only thing. job specification says demonstrated. Can you give me examples of where you have demonstrated uh, those situations? So you can, you can uh, follow those up with uh, reference checks that will verify that. Hey, Terry. Yep. Could, could that say ability and responsibility? <coughs> ability and responsibility to compile data that we built? So that the stuff that we can do? Yeah, that, I would be comfortable with that. We need something more. Well, that's my goal. Make yeah. me comfortable with yeah, I know, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Does that work? Or Does that work? Ability, ability and responsibility? That's what we're going to do is hold them responsible. <coughs> we haven't used an evaluation anymore. Uh, no. no. But responsibility <coughs> is not not to split hairs, but it's not uh, a knowledge, skill, or ability. That the responsibility is bestowed on them. They would have responsibility for that. That would be in the uh, distinguishing features or typical work activities. That's the responsibility. Uh, I would think in the uh, KSAs, and you would do that through <coughs> demonstrating uh, the demonstrated building. Well, what's the one before? Is it the slide before that one no, talks sorry. about the expectations? Typical work activities. So, this is work activities. These are work activities. Which basically Maybe that's the place to put it. I know what you're talking about, Tucker. Um, <coughs> okay. Okay, I'm good with the demonstrator. Demonstrate ability. And then lead down abilities with demonstrate. Keith, it would make me more comfortable. I'm fine, man. Frank. An individual may um, give it evidence that he's assuming responsibility, but he's not performing as far as full capacity. Okay, and if he's not performing full capacity, could we put him in a situation of being insubordinate and incompetent? Yeah, that's kind of what Tucker's getting at, I think, right, Tucker? So, therefore, I would like to say something that's uh, concrete as far as performance. Right. Either be able to produce or else uh, forget it. Mm -hmm. Could we have a slide that figure out Pardon how long is the next step was trying to figure out how... Well, I'm trying to wake you up. Less uh, department heads that they have to evaluate. That's the next step past this process, right? The idea that there's 27 department heads we're trying to get it down to. Yeah, it's a different, that's different a process. Different process yeah. Right? yeah, but that's the goal. And then the, the other question is, I can't quite tell who we have committee meetings. Is who's presenting? The administrators presenting all the reports, or is each individual department in the report? So the way we've the, the way we frame that is essentially the administrator and department heads would attend committee meetings, uh, and then really probably be a joint discussion between the minister and department and who presented. So they both be there or both be responsible to be there. Uh, I think we also said that at some point administrator may delegate that based on what they <coughs> have going on or that type of thing. But primarily the goal was both be there and then discuss on who would present the actual information. Yeah, and that's in the that discussion is, is contained more in the uh, what's Charter. that thing called the the operating the framework. framework. The framework thing yeah. that wouldn't be in the Which is job description. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was looking at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But well, before we move off this, so how do we change this? Where are we with this? Because it would be good to get this wording done because we're going to right. approve it tonight, hopefully. Follow protocol. This man here has had his hand up for five minutes. Right. No, there's some resolving this. Don't worry about it. He, oh, yeah. he has a I'm different issue. Back right? here observing. <laughs> well, good well, he's, he's, he slouched down. Who could see him behind Andy? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Andy so, is is ability ability the um, ability to um, to do and to and demonstration is that good? What was the wording that I would say that to be vague. So I, had, I wrote down demonstrate the ability. So if you lead demonstrate the with each in front of each of those abilities, would that so suffice? Is that good for you? Okay. So we'll well, make that need we'll to keep. do that, yeah. uh, just have the ability. We'll make right. that change. Listen, the question is, are we going to have an individual that's able to perform, or, or is it because he has the ability and he's not performing? 
Well, if you if, if the requirement is to demonstrate the ability and you don't demonstrate it, but going it in or during the year, but yes. So but to does. what degree? Well, that's you. Uh, that's what an evaluation is about. I mean, how you how do you quantify that? Okay. Uh, what kind of a predicament would that put us in if he has very very limited ability and we need somebody of a uh, superior nature? Mm. Don't hire him. Don't hire him. Yeah. Well, he's already hired. Well, that's where the evaluation will come in. Mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> Jeff? It would seem like part of the interview process would be for the applicant to show their ability to. Yeah, see. that's a good point. A demonstration. Yeah, particularly if we have, if we put that, demonstrate the ability. Right. Or yeah. give examples of their ability, right? right? Demonstrating their ability. Okay, good. Okay, well, that's, that's good on that. Are there other issues with this? With the job description itself, any concerns, changes? Ben? I don't remember in any of our meetings talking about um, the requirements for a four year degree or anything like that. And I have a, a problem with that because there's a lot of people out there that don't have a four year degree but yet have been um, managing large businesses or whatever for many years. And why would we exclude those type of people? Yeah, I think the current, what's the wording on the current one? In the local law, the language under minimum quals that I think you're referring to, uh, Ben, is number three, an equivalent combination of training and experience listed above. I think that's what you're referring to. That's in the local law, yeah, but it, it's that not. That sounds a lot better than a four-year degree, doesn't it? Depends on what you're looking for. I mean, yeah, if you want to leave the door open for that possibility, that individual, then you put the language in. It depends if you spent your career in community college. <laughs> yeah, no. But is everybody good with that? That's it. He's, he's suggesting we change, we add, not change, but, change, add, right. but add this. That. If you could read that again, Fred. And if, any equivalent combination of training and experience listed above. Does anyone object to adding that as a qualification? What I have no objection. Is what Ben's talking about. Excuse me. I have no objection, but I like to see the number of years of experience that uh, he's exemplified. I think that might come out at the interview process. You might get somebody who has training and experience, and the interview group in his body would ask the question, how much experience do you have? Tell us what it is and why that particular person is qualified to do the job. That might be hard to quantify in this Doctor, but I understand the question. I think Mike has a suggestion. Uh, yeah, based on the terminology that Fred was using, in a case like that, so um, uh, like a possession of a bachelor's degree and have a minimum of six years, so or any equivalent, so that would be uh, 10 years experience if there's no degree. Then it would be 10 years of experience in uh, uh, responsible management experience in private or public uh, business or industrial enterprise. Well, that's what I would like to see in writing as far as meeting the qualifications. Okay. Is that acceptable to you, Ben? Is that acceptable, acceptable to you defining yeah, equivalent? Yeah, I, don't, I don't have any problem with any of them because it's going to come out in their resume anyhow with the experiences. So, I mean, you don't have to worry about getting the person in the room unless you, you know, you're satisfied with it when you're looking at the resume. Yeah. But we would, I, I'd like a, uh, from a recruitment standpoint, uh, uh, a parameter. I, I like the idea of what you said. So if, if we utilize 10 years of experience, uh, and, and I would normally say 10 years progressively responsible experience in a uh, uh, business situation, so then we can discern between those candidates. Being the optimist, I think we're going to get lots of candidates. And I'd like to be able to. Uh, you may get less quiet candidates, but I think you'll get better quiet, uh, better quali uh, qualified <coughs> people. And. and I, I would like to be able to be sure that and, we know where the And that's what we want. We want good qualified people. Yeah. So, so is I that agreeable to use, use Mike saying 10 years of progressively responsible experience? Does anyone object to that <coughs> language? All right. That's a little I guess the only thing I got on that is basically we're taking out <coughs> Any young, talented, 
two, three years out of college type person, then I mean, we're... No, because they could have the... Well, the, we were talking 10 years of experience. Well, no, 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 that's if you don't have college. It's a substitute. It's, oh. it's, these are or. This or this or this. Okay. Yeah, we can go with that. Yep. All right. This is new. Okay. Other other points. Okay. Are there questions on the framework, which was distributed, Mr. Lattimore? I brought up at uh, government ops last night. Um, I mean, we've we've done this before. Um, I understand why we did it. And I, I think it's a good, good way that we're moving. But at last night, I, I said let's have a county executive who could who could hire a manager to do the day-to-day -day operations. Let let somebody you know, just like a mayor and a deputy mayor. Uh, I think there's better frameworks out there uh, than committee systems that we have today. Uh, you know, I'd like to see a full ledge four times a month. Uh, so we're all informed about all the subjects that, that are before the body, and uh, I'd like to see a county exec form of government. Yeah, and I, th I think what was decided at government ops was to, and Mr. Foley, I think, will follow up with that, yeah. is begin a discussion next month yeah. on yeah. just that, but then yeah. in the meantime, move forward with getting yeah. someone in here. Okay. Framework. Any other... Comments or okay, then I guess. Oh, Mr. Didio, sorry. We have, uh, I sat through approximately five hours of uh, presentations and discussions regarding Mr. Miller and the, the uh, matrix and things of that nature, and it was educational for me when people. And again, bringing it here and having, uh, you know, a single word change, I think, I think that's great, and I think we need to move forward with it. Okay. Everything that I've heard, anyway. Okay, good. In that case, would you like to make a motion to approve the description and the associated framework motion. and take it forward? We have a motion, a second. Mr. Pinkney, any discussion of that? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. So, yes, yeah. The 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 next step with it. Well, also let me move on here, but the, the and then come back to the the law. But if there are no objections, then we'll also move forward with the uh, search committee of of uh, as we've discussed with three legislators, two department heads, and two uh, members of the public, and that Mr. Russell chairing the group, and that we'll bring the names forward for appointment at the June 27th meeting so that we'll have that the, hopefully we'll have the names at that point so the body can vote on that composition of the committee not just in theory but in specifics so that'll be the plan if no one objects okay great the next step in this then um, I mean we're going to proceed with search and so on but we do need a, a local law that reflects this and so that that's why we had the local law from 2010 the, so Fred will work on that. Um, we'll do this this process parallel. Yes. Do you want me to have that for Ways and Means next week? If, if can you do that for next week? I can do that for next He's week. He's going to have this the local law for Ways and Means next week. It probably won't be very good because it'll be rushed. <laughs> but I'll try my best. Sure. We'll do this. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, great. Then, Mr. Miller, thank you very thank much. You. We appreciate thank your you. work and. Appreciate the outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Great job, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Checks in the mail. <laughs> Checks in the mail. So, well, at this point, then, thank you all for for uh, for coming. Thank you for getting my text. Things moved a little faster than I thought they would. So, um, at this point, we have a presentation, the budget presentation from the college. The, uh, if you remember, Mr. Mahonik suggested that we do this one presentation with the full legislature. This meeting was scheduled for this purpose. The timing worked quite quite nicely. So the president is here. Mr. Lattimore. Uh, Mr. Mahonik, I count on him for educational pieces, and he's not here tonight. Well, he had an un he, he, it was, he, he was unexpectedly 
called to his to a son award banquet. That it was. Uh, I mean, he can um, he can tell you how the the, uh, the confusion. But that's he. It was his family or us, and he chose his family, which I know is surprising to us all. But well, I mean, in educational matters, I thought yeah. yourself being from the college and Pat would be a great insight. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw the barbs. Low tech. Are you ready, Mr. Chairman? I uh, we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for the time and the opportunity. Um, uh, really appreciate the chance to present uh, present our proposed 2017-18 budget for the Q Community College to you. As you as you may know, the process starts for us uh, for me back in about December when we start to do our revenue projections and work through the entire spring. And, and the real kind of holdup, if you will, to, to get to this point is waiting the state legislature and the executive budget in April, which then allows us to set our tuition and fee schedule, ultimately have our board of trustees consider this, which they did approve in May, and now here for you and for your, your consideration. So if you'll indulge me, I'll take a few moments and just walk through. I was just trained, so I'm well trained. Um, uh, really how I think that you go through a budget development process and to hopefully answer some questions and, and allow this as a chance to kind of give you all a little bit more detail on some of the things that um, I talk about more in theory um, and you know monthly so for us when whenever we whenever whenever I work with the team to say we need to create our budget what matters most um, from my perspective is that you understand what your assumptions are and really fundamentally looking at what your assumptions are as they relate to creating a revenue. And because ultimately, as you know well, and all the due diligence that you do here at the county, what really matters as an organization institution from my perspective is that whatever, your, whatever expected revenues you look to have, that your expenses must match. Um, there's no reason to create expenses beyond that point unless you feel comfortable with your revenue sources, even if that includes a fund balance, to be able to make those things happen. So today, you're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through what our budget assumptions are, and then I'll tell you a little bit about where, where I think we are as an institution, and I think some of the proof of where we are as an institution. Also, we're gonna talk about um, the general revenue, um, what that means, while we'll go into our expenses from, uh, from a high level, and then ultimately, I wanna give you all an update on where I believe we are, um, where I know we are today as a, for a fund balance and where I believe where we will be in a couple of months when the end of our fiscal year at the end of, of August comes comes to because I know there's been some questions about it so when we look at assumptions and if you'll you'll indulge me on sometimes I teach so I'll, I'll do that um, you can see here I want to provide the comparison of fiscal year 17, so fiscal year 17 for us, obviously, is the year that we are currently in, and that ends at the end of August. We build our budget in 2017 on 2510, right? That's the FTE, that's not the number of students we serve, that's a formula that's created based on the total credit hours you sell, divided by 30, results in what a full-time equivalency is. So 2510 is where we, what we built our budget on. As I've been telling you for, for uh, repeatedly for months, we actually anticipate to end fiscal year 17 above 25-10. So we anticipate to have enrollment above our original budget projections from, from a year ago. Um, likely to be in the 25-20 something range, very close when you're talking about a projection that ultimately we made 15 months ago. So we used information, we developed an FTE projection, we developed a budget, and we're going to be within 15 FTE or so from that particular budget. And if you look at the percent related to that, I think you feel pretty comfortable in kind of taking that methodology. Last year, our board of trustees reluctantly, but um, you know, in very great support, and I should recognize that our chair of our trustees, Dr. Lindemann Butler, is with me tonight, so thank you for being here with them. The trustees approved a 3.99 tuition increase. That did, and, and candidly, we also added a number of fees a year ago because we, we were not in line with where the expenses were related to the fees from the college. My first year, we did an analysis to say, if we're charging X, as an example, if we're charging X amount of dollars for science lab fees, and it's generating Y revenue, but the expenses related to those 
educational expenses is twice as much. We need to not put that burden on other students that are not enrolled in those science courses. We either need to cut what we need to run those science courses or increase the fee for those particular students taking those courses to match. That's how educational fees related to courses are, are supposed to be created in my opinion. So we did a lot of that matching and a lot of that analysis a year ago. That resulted in a tuition of $4,499. That's an annual cost outside of fees. That's tuition for fall and spring. And last year, we had a state contribution increase of $100. I'll show more detail than that. But this year, <coughs> what you're considering in front of you, or at least the assumptions that generate what ultimately is in front of you, is we're building our budget on 2550 FTP. We believe, we're hopeful, that we, because we're going to end this year better than what we did, um, than what we originally budgeted for, because we have seen some new programs come in line that we've created with high school partners, and because of a couple of other new academic programs that have come in line, and our admissions applications have been tracking since October up between 13 and 15 percent for fall, we believe that it's, that it's reasonable to assume that we will be have a, an increase in enrollment compared to where we, where we are this year, based on those factors. Um, the one caveat to that, of course, is we've seen an increase of our retention rates, and so we might actually see an increase in the number of graduates we have on, on a quicker pace, if you will, which actually could have a, another impact to us, but in the end, if I'm telling you we're, we're down or closer to even because we had more students graduate earlier, I think we all could reasonably say that's still a good thing. And we would be able to demonstrate that with data, of course. So this year, our trust is <coughs> affordability is key to us. You know, I recommended and they supported only a 1% tuition increase. That results in the 45 44 and then ultimately, we end up with a state contribution increase per FT of $50, which you'll see in a slide in a moment, which is actually a reduction for us in state aid. So those are the assumptions that are the basis for all revenue projections from the with college grades and budget. So what does that mean in revenue? Well, I wish I would have put in here the 15-16 budget, because if I did, what you would have what you would have seen is in this column here, that budget was over was well over $30 million. If you recall a year ago, I told you that we cut $1.5 million off of our budget from one year to another. And so we got our budget down to $29,689. And in this year, what I'm proposing for you, based on our assumptions of revenue, is that we are actually bringing in a budget again, slightly under the budget that we have this year. And that budget results in $29,677. So our revenues get us to the point where, based on our assumptions, that that is the only that is the place where we felt like we could get. Now let me tell you what's included in here. What's included in here, of course, is in some highlights is some loss of revenue. One of them is in the area of state contribution. You can see, and you told me there's a red light here, right? You can see here that we are, in the state contribution side, we are actually seeing a reduction of nearly $600,000 of state aid. I just told you we've got an increase of $50 per FTE. Well, the aidable number of FTE is down because the college for the last six years or so has tracked slightly down in enrollment, although we're hopeful next year we actually tick back up again for the first time in, I think, about six years. So that goes down. In addition to that, through some cleanup and policy review and so forth, there is some rental aid that the college was collecting that we're no longer going to collect, which it was in that category of state support, which ultimately impacts a couple hundred thousand dollars, which is there. And, you know, we're there. What you also see here, though, is we've been able to construct a budget that continues to have a very stark, very strong chargeback rate. And the chargeback rate, you all probably have talked about it and examined it for what you may pay for students that live in Hugo County who go to other schools, other community colleges like Finger Lakes, TC3, or, or Onondaga. Well, if you looked at their rate compared to ours, I will tell you you will be astounded and very grateful that you're not paying our chargeback rate. Because our chargeback rate per pupil for the other counties next year will be $3,400 per FTE. 
I don't know if you know that, I think, I think some OCCs is somewhere in the $1,900 range. I can't, don't hold me to that, but it, it's, it's significantly different. I won't bore you with the why, I can demonstrate it to you, but I won't tonight, and another point if you want to me to show you how methodologies of chargeback rates work just for your own edification, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that in small groups of the larger. But, so you can see here in a sponsor contribution, we are asking for a 1.5% increase. That means approximately $43,000. And that's what we're asking, that's what I'm asking for you to consider in this budget. You also can see here that um, we have an increase, projected increase of students that are coming from out of state or non-resident tuition. That 419 is not, that 419 actually better reflects what the accurate number is today based on our trend and based on what we're actually realizing this year. So even though it's not us saying, well, we expect to get, you know, 5% more students from out of the area next year. That doesn't, it represents more of the actual revenue generation a current distribution of student demographics today. The other thing that we're doing in this budget, which is different than in years past, is we're recognizing the Perkins money, which is a grant that comes into us that's to support career technical education. We're recognizing that as a revenue source because one of the things that I think was important in my analysis of the way that we created budgets in the past was we need to put all revenue on the revenue sheet and all expenses on the expense sheet so that we know everything that's coming in and expected to be spent out and that everything's accounted for in the beginning. So that's why we're recognizing that. You will see here in order to get to 29,677 and, and, and essentially make up for state contribution, we have, all, we have allocated, our trustees have allocated $300,000 of our fund balance to do that. I'm going to, even though I say, and I'll say this for, for, for the future, even though I say we have to create a budget of expenses and match revenues, we do. Fund balance can be a revenue source, but I'm going to demonstrate to you in a couple of pages why I feel comfortable in utilizing these funds for next year specifically. Um, it is not the long-term answer. This, this, is a, this is something that I think makes sense now given the circumstance for now. And you'll also see your miscellaneous, miscellaneous fees and, and, and generation of, of revenue is down. Some of that's a factor of enrollment. Some of that's a factor for how we're actually recognizing some of these fees and applying them. But ultimately, that results in the, in the 29.6. So, so, so again, to summarize, we have the 25.50 FTE, the 1% tuition increase that's recognized in those numbers and that distribution. The $50 increase um, from state and what that represents. And then the fees themselves, um, the way that we're recognizing the program and the sponsor contributions, $44,000. So on the expense side, you can see here that we have, um, you know, and obviously our budget, the total expenses line up to what we just said and, and the side. But what you can also see here is that, you know, we've had some changes. The most notable one that creates some confusion is right here in the student tech fee. So the student tech fee, um, the money hasn't disappeared. But what we've tried to do is to, again, in the, in, the, in the spirit of saying, well, what is it that we need to purchase? Let's know now, let's make the allocation now. And then therefore, when it gets right to the top of the fiscal year, we can go and, and do what we need to do. Before it was, it, was a, it was a set aside amount of money that there was another bureaucracy or process for later on in the academic year where people requested and so forth. And I just felt like it was cumbersome and just simply not needed. So ultimately, the student tech fee, as we saw in the previous slide, it generates, it generates you know, more than double that. But for projects and other technology, those things are actually now embedded within things like general, okay? Or in other, in, in other areas where you can, in equipment. So when you say, well, why is there a big jump in these areas? It's because we're, we're taking this and we're now recognizing a part of it, recognizing in the actual categories in which we intend to spend those funds to better align where we're at. So it's not as though it went away, it's just the way that we're recognizing them in the particular, in the particular aspect. Any questions on the expense or the revenue side? Yeah? Ryan's got a question. Yeah. The student tech fee. Yeah. Um, so just, so you're still charging Students. Technically speaking, 
the student tech fee is the only mandated fee that you can put on a student that is ultimately allowable and the one of the initial uh, one of the initial analyses that we did a year ago was that the utilization of that fee historically was used in a rather limited way the student tech fee was established by the SUNY Board of Trustees um, and actually confirmed uh, locally at, at the Cuban Community College trustee level several years ago and the scope of it can actually be used for any sort of technology including staffing and other subscriptions um, and licenses and so forth software hardware that affects any aspect of student technology so candidly a year ago when we increased the fee slightly and we tried to reapply it to other areas we were able to look at how do we help offset some costs and, and supporting students say in the help desk area or other areas of, of staffing it doesn't impact their staff risk it's just we have an allowable revenue source to apply towards these allowable expenses that allow us to not to use it three times but that give us the opportunity to be able to help offset um, other things in a way so the student technology fee today is eleven dollars per credit hour. So what was it previous that it went to? You said it was nine dollars per credit. Hour. No, no, but it, you said it went to when you passed it initially. It was going to certain origin. So two years, two years ago, and probably much before that, the fee, the fee was always there, generating several hundred thousand dollars, and that was being spent on tech projects. But what was happening in the budget process, the one that you would have saw, the one that the trustees saw. It was just a, it was just a set aside money that was future going to be defined in the future. This year, I asked for all specific requests up front. What could be considered for tech fee? What could be considered for other? Because just because if tech fee can't cover an equipment purchase, that doesn't mean you couldn't cover it in another revenue source if it was important to our mission, vision, and goals. And so, but most importantly, from a budget perspective. I don't want other what-if expenses out there that aren't accounted for when we go through the process once because then it just feels as though we're looking for other pockets of money and ultimately they all roll up to institutional dollars <coughs> and that just didn't make any sense to me yeah. <clears throat> on the uh, out-of-state non-resident tuition yep. uh, those numbers are like a 35 percent increase yep. what, what drives that it really just better it better reflects actual actual um, revenue that was there. So we I went and looked at we went and looked at it as a group and said okay we put. What did we put in? Oh, oh, I have to go back. Two seventy nine. Okay, we put two seventy nine in last year. Last year, but what did we actually receive? Okay, that's what it is. You got we more. received close to four nineteen. So we're reconciling and say, well, if we're going to go forward, let's put in what we actually received a year ago, instead of instead of just putting an understating it. Didn't make any, didn't necessarily make sense. If we knew that it was expected to be more likely, and it actually better reflects a little bit more of the trend data, that it's closer to what it what, what it was. Thank you. Yeah. Andy, what what does a student actually pay? I mean, you, you show what the you said there's fees on top of tuition. So what does it what does it actually cost a student to go to community college? So the base if you're a full time student, okay, and you're going for the year, you're going to be paying the forty four ninety nine this year, whatever it is. Right. That's your tuition. If you are so in so then on top of that you're paying approximately $130 student activity fee. You're paying approximately, well, you're paying $11 per however many credits you enroll in, so at least 12 each semester for this technology fee. We have a wellness fee of $20, which allows you access to the fitness center and so forth for the semester. And you know, on top of that, you'll be paying for, if you take a course, and they're not all courses, but some of the courses that are highly technical, like nursing program is a nursing program fee, which is typical everywhere. You're paying a differential for that. If you're in a science lab course, you may pay $25 for the for a lab fee to help with the expenses that go with it. So there's some fees that so that varies by student. And then of course on top of that is the books. So we would say, we looked at this at one point. I would say the average cost for a student excluding books, because that's we didn't include that, we didn't include that, 
in our sample is closer to about five thousand dollars on, on last year's number so I would say between 51 and 5200 for the year but you might want to mention what percentage of our students get financial aid oh yeah I mean, well over 80 percent of our students get aid <coughs> Tim <coughs> Doctor, it was uh, very nice to be with you and, and, and Dr. Linda the other day with the nursing program graduation. I was filling in for Vice Chairman Vitale. It was uh, nice that, that every one of those graduates had a job, a J-O-B, after their graduation. And I just saw a presentation for the downtown revitalization with the culinary yeah. uh, program. That's going to be a new program. Is there any startup cost included in that? And, yeah. How much grant money are we going to get from the state? Um, I'm not sure how much grant money we'll get, but we, we are a partner in the, the Downtown Revitalization Initiative to potentially look at having some sort of a site, whether it's exclusive or not, is yet to be determined. But we know, fundamentally we know, and I've been talking about this in other avenues, and I've been seeking some resources for this in other venues, that agriculture in this community, in our county, is a major driver and fundamentally I believe the college needs to improve its conversation dialogue and responsibility and engagement with that particular community and we've had a number of people in this area talk to us about culinary arts talk to us about our you know continuing education offerings in these areas and a number of other possibilities so when this revitalization opportunity came available um, what would make sense particularly for the college at this time given other initiatives given our strategic plan we felt as though that um, partnering with the city and the potential to have a presence to have um, look at culinary, whether it be credit or non credit, to look at opportunities for um, engaging, you know, sort of food systems and agriculture in another way, building up that identity for <coughs> community college. We just felt like it was a great opportunity for that. We recently have launched um, online programs in the areas of tourism and hospitality. So those are just live and actually going into play this year. And um, the college for actually a number of years has been working on developing a culinary program, looking at partnerships in BOCES and others for facilities and other pieces. And so, um, you know, as the grant process moves itself through, depending on how it goes, what it is, what scale it is, and what other impacts may be are there. But the college is already looking at how do we, in at least in the very least, begin in the conversation with local agricultural leaders on are there ways that we as an institution of higher learning can support you and what areas could we support them and then and then we will respond um, my experience tells me the wrong way to go is to say this is what I think the ag community needs without the absence of conversation and planning so our, our exploration at this point is fundamentally about let's 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 engage let's help to create a, kind of a microphone for that voice and an identity that we're at least a college that's recognizing and engaged with that particular community that's such an important sector for us Right. Yeah, uh, I would be interested to understand um, why books wouldn't be considered as part of when when you are looking into the cost of tuition, uh, only because it, they can be a significant expense for a student, five hundred, a thousand dollars a semester, just depending. I mean, there, I'm sure there are studies that have been done. Um, that can give you an average of SUNY or of right. this area, but uh, so, and I think that's important if you're talking about a percentage, right? Well, a good percentage of tuition. well, if, if if I were if you were to say what do you I think the average cost for student books are per semester, I would tell you that I think the average cost for a student is somewhere between three hundred and fifty and four hundred dollars if they are a full time student, and I believe the data would would support that. If you are a nursing student. If you're a student who's taking a number of science courses, if you're, it, it, it's going to go up dramatically from there, okay? But if you're looking at, if you're taking 15, 15 credits or five classes, five techs, I will tell you I have been impressed with Cugus, with Cugus faculty commitment. In a number of areas, we're doing, they're using open source material. And the more open source material and other things come available and people gain confidence in it, um, you know, since Cugus is an institution that has such a high percentage of its courses online, using using that kind of modality is, is perfect for different resources to provide that sort of other educa alternative education versus, versus a textbook. And I think they're looking at doing that. We also have been committed to having textbook rental programs and other programs in place for students to help minimize those costs as best as best we can. It's, it's, 
it's not unique to us and, and you know I shouldn't have been so dismissive of it but I would I would have just added four hundred dollars to it on average thank you compared to other TC3 on Daga what's their tuition rate is that and then does that affect your student enrollment people looking comparing between the other local community colleges you know, I should have anticipated that and included that. I don't have that information offhand. I can tell you this. I believe the other institutions around us are doing more significant uh, increases. But I can, I'll can i have that data chart for me at committee level when we come to show the comparison costs of the other schools around us. And is student housing, is, what's, is that any part of your discussions in the future or past what's already downtown? Is that yeah, I, I mean, I, anyway I've said this candidly to our, to our trustees and our, since, since Linda's here, uh, she's heard me say this. I believe that Cuga uh, needs to get other things in place before student housing is a viable option for us. Um, I've, I've, you know, I've mentioned before one of the, one of my accomplishments I'm most proud of is, is leading a leading a campus residential program from commuter to housing um, to residential. And I can tell you, to be a 24/7 campus takes a great deal more than just building a building. Mm -hmm. And you need to have public safety in place. You need to have recreation in place. You need to have food. You need to have wellness. You need to have a bunch of things. And I can tell you they cost money, as you can imagine. And in order to do that, you need to make sure that the number of students that are going to be interested in your housing facility um, exceed those additional expenses that are going to come to at least more than break even. Um, I also think that, um, and this is a conversation we'll be having at another venue another time, I believe that our campus needs to be modernized to help support 24-7 learners. Um, we're in a competitive market. We're in a competitive market. You just mentioned, you just mentioned schools, and you said it's cost a factor for choice, and it can be, particularly when the geography is so close, right? If you live 10 minutes from here, you know, south of here, and you said, well, I could choose to go to Cuga Community College, or I could choose to go an extra five minutes potentially to Onondaga Community College. Programs are going to be a factor also going to be a fact cost may be a factor but another factor is going to be is it a place where you want to be excited to be and is a place that you feel like is, is that it meets a certain standard a visual that you have for what a college campus should be and um, I believe I believe together we have to make sure that our campus represents us all of us in the way that best serves students and want students to want students want to come here and um, not that it doesn't but I've talked with some of you, and some of you have told me, you know what, a lot of the campus looks the same as it did when I went here, or years ago. And I can assure you that is not the expectation of many students today. And so that may take resources, that may take creativity, but I think together we have to look at that. And, and the more we can, I, we need to have athletic programs. We need to have athletic facilities to be able to attract students from out of the area, without a doubt. Fundamentally, I can, I can tell you this without any reservation, that one of the reasons why someone may choose to come here over another institution is the chance to play a sport. And if we have the facilities to bring baseball here, to add lacrosse, men's and women's lacrosse, bring them back, they were shuttered, I think men's lacrosse was shuttered about a month before I, before I came. Bring them here, give, give student athletes a chance to compete, give student athletes an identity out there in, in a grander way than there. You, you would be able to reshape your potential for student housing right away. You also would be able to kind of extend your footprint of, of reasons other than academic programs when I go. If you look at our course catalog and any other community college's course catalog across the system, we're going to find that about 85% of it, 80% of it, is essentially the same. We have qualified, wonderful faculty, staff. Um, student experience is tremendous at the college. So you have to look at all the reasons why they want to go. I think geography is a great reason. Location is a great reason, right? Cost is a great reason. But we also need to know that other things, other than academics, are going to be the reasons why people <coughs> choose to go where they go. And so we need to have that conversation and vision, and hopefully somehow we can try to figure out a creative way to figure out the resources for it. If I may suggest, why don't we hold these, the, the questions have gotten general. Why don't we do this? Let's get through the budget presentation see what questions we have on the budget, and then if people have these kinds of questions about the future direction or other related issues, we can circle back. So, Lord, why don't you, if you would. Protecting them of my soapbox. 
So we went through the expenses, and again, general highlights, just to, just to provide some rationale. And, I, and we'll, we'll, we can share this and get the copies out to everyone so you can look at it more, more closely. Yeah. I wanted to provide context to it before I shared it specifically. So what else is in the budget? Well, what isn't in this slide, we've had a number of positions and vacancies over the years, and I will tell you the community has been very welcoming and supportive of the idea that when we have had vacancies over the last two years, there have been a number of them that we have not been able to replace. You don't cut one and a half million dollars from your budget a year ago without any major headlines and major other mom moments without holding things vacant and making other cuts. We did that together as a unit and we were able to figure that out together. This year we had a number of other retirements and other other vacancies. But we are able to replace some of those lines and reinvest them in key areas related to our mission and vision at this point. So we have in our budget a tenure track line in computer science. We believe that technology and computer science and building up that curricula is an important area for us. And we're going to look and invest in a new faculty line in that area. Biology, uh, we have a number of biology classes that are highly subscribed, a um, number of sections year round. It's, just, it was, uh, it's a high need area for us to add another talent. We have in here a one-year temporary position faculty line in the, in the area of English. We did actually have some retirees this year, but we have another line in there for a one-year temp. That gives us flexibility, by the way. It also gives us great quality candidates to fill these roles. And we have a one-year temp in here for our early child education program, which we have, a, we have a degree program for that this year we held vacant. We didn't have a full-time faculty member on the line. On accreditation standards, you have to. And so we, you know, we're going to do that for this next year and continue to review that particular program. On the staff side, we have we put in the we put in the um, we put in the budget a position that we've yet to define in the financial aid and business area. The world of financial aid for students, we just talked a lot about affordability and access to funds, is, is more and more complicated as, as we go. The Excelsior program, a wonderful for those uh, middle class New Yorkers who will take advantage of it, you know, may require some additional um, work for the institution side of it. And so yet to really understand what the impacts may be, even without that program, we really felt as though that's a critical area that if we hit our enrollment marks and we feel confident in the fall, we'll, we'll likely define a position in, in, and bring one in place. We also have identified that in the area of resource development, uh, you know, the world of grants and competitive grants and landscape, we mentioned one earlier today, we, we really need to build that, um, that area of our college. And, to my knowledge, it's been a number of years since the college has had a grant writer at all. And I think when the time where they did, perhaps it was connected more with the foundation than with this, the institution or the college specifically. So our trustees um, have been very supportive of this. And actually, it was one of the two positions that um, was identified when I first arrived from inside the college of that faculty and staff felt as though that we needed. So we've been able to secure that in the budget for next year. We have two full-time administrative assistant lines that we're filling. The searches are already ongoing. Those are actually replacing some part-timers that, and that's actually related to um, some other decisions that, need to be, that needed to be made based on collective bargaining groups and others. But we're excited to be able to add those to help support some of our professional and executive staff in the fall. And in the Dean of Students and Chief Diversity Officer, I mentioned this, I believe, at the, uh, the meeting at uh, Emerson Park last, last month. One of the SUNY uh, regulations and mandates that had, was identified a couple of years ago was that each campus, each SUNY campus, all 64, by August of this year needed to have a chief diversity officer in place um, to meet the diversity, inclusion, and equity policy that uh, SUNY Board of Trustees have established. We had a task force this year that reviewed job descriptions, they identified community <coughs> need and opportunities, and ultimately provided a recommendation to me and then I did to the board that said we, we need to reframe and restructure our student life and student affairs area, the area of conduct, the area of mental health, the area of, of diversity and inclusion are getting complex and, and we really could benefit from adding that administrative layer. So with the support of the trustees, mm -hmm. not only is that um, will bring us to compliance with the SUNY regulation because it actually has to also be a senior official, this will allow us to, uh, I think, really strengthen some of our administrative areas and key areas. So those positions are in the budget as well. And the other last piece that uh, I wanted to just go over is the fund balance. So, um, you know, we are in a unique situation because when we, <clears throat> when we look back at the start of, of fiscal year, uh, or, or September 1, 2016, we actually 
Um, we were in a we were in a place where the fund balance we had got up to 2.2 million. When I say got up to 2.2 million, it was a year ago with the budget that um, that was inherited when I arrived. The the allocation of fund balance in that year's budget was 1.3 million dollars. If we were to use that entire fund balance, we would have resulted on September 1, 2016, with a fund balance at 1.2 million dollars. Working together, because we and by the way, the enrollment numbers were met. We actually missed the enrollment numbers last year by almost uh, 120 FTE, my first year here. But working together, working with our trustees, we were able to find savings within the budget and ultimately not spend all that was allocated to result in a fund balance that started this year at $2.2 million. And the budget that we're currently living in in 1617 had no utilization of fund balance at all, none. We are on pace based on some circumstances that we've controlled and some that we don't, that we believe that we are going to add to our fund balance at the end of this year, in two months, $1.2 million to our reserves, leading us to a fund balance well over 3.4, which is the reason why I'm comfortable for this year, including just over $300,000 of fund balance utilization for next year. <coughs> When Middle States was here a year ago, one of the things that they gave for a goal for the college um, was to build your fund balance 10% of your operating costs. And as you can see, at $3 million, with a budget of 29.6, we would be able to achieve that within a year and a half. So, you know, fundamentally, um, we think the budget is that we present to you, even though we're asking for 1.5%, we think it's responsible in the area of student affordability by only increasing tuition one percent. We believe that by bringing a budget that's actually essentially flat, slightly down than a year ago, and um, being able to align with some of the investments we have, both programmatically and in staff, that we think it's a responsible budget that helps us actually move forward and uh, isn't just reacting to uh, to a decline. So, with that, I just would ask for your consideration for the increased support. Okay, Mr. Ladewa. I, I uh, as an alumni, I, I mean, I have no problem with the, with the increase. Uh, but one of the one of the jewels in your crown was the uh, the uh, NASA Regional Application Center, uh, the Institute for Application of Geospatial Technology. I know the president's got you know a gazillion dollars in in his budget for NASA, and we should. Uh, revitalize that as much as we can and uh, I've spoken to you several times on that issue I think we could fill the seats with that program and um, you know I, I have no problem with with increasing if right. we don't lose one of the jewels in the crown I appreciate the question and I and I, I actually I, I wouldn't mind taking uh, two minutes just to just so people understand um, the differences that sometimes get lumped together um, as an example, CareerWorks is housed at the college, right? But I believe that's a county agency. Yes. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yep. No one ever, I don't think, confuses that with that's the college. Um, although we, we love hosting them and, and benefit greatly, I think, by them being there. But IAGT, similarly, is its own entity that cannot be funded by college dollars. Cannot. So when we talk about where they're at as an entity, that entity itself 